Our seats, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to welcome you all to Corona College of Education public lecture for today. And um, students, um, representative, the speaker, our faculty, you're welcome. Thank you for gracing this occasion with us. Um, we would like to also um, start the national anthem all over again. As we can see, our speaker wasn't here. So we'll run through the program from the beginning, please. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for um, for that. Um, now we're going to the next on the agenda, which is the opening prayer. We call on um, Mr. Modi for the opening prayer for this morning. Shall we all rise? A mighty and everlasting King of glory, we thank you for this gathering. We appreciate your ever presence amongst us. And we say that take preeminence of this occasion today in Jesus' name. We commit the speaker and even the listeners today unto your noble can we pray that the end of this lecture will have reasons to glorify your name. We commit those that are on the way that Father, you guide them safely, and people connecting virtually also, Father, you grant them peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. 
Then we will have I say thank you very much, Mr. Modi, the Dean School of Education. Thank you very much. Now we're going to um, the introduction of guests. We are highly excited to have you all here. And we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, first, we'll want to acknowledge um, Dr. Wahab Ademola Aziz, the Provost, CEO, Federal College of Education Technical, Akoka. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. Then um, the members of the College Council, we appreciate you as well. Chairman, CSET Governing Council, Mr. Dotson Sulaiman, MFR. We thank you very much. The Chief Executive Officer, Corona Schools Trust Council, in person of Mrs. Adeyonyi Adeshino, who would likely be online. We appreciate you, ma'am. We say thank you very much. Thank you for um, being part of this third, third public lecture. In person of Dr. Ms. Dr. Taiwo Omome, a, a representative for um, Rector Yaba College of Education Technology. We say thank you very much. Thank you for being here as well. We appreciate you. Um, Barrister Femi, Ajibade Ogunusi, Education Secretary, Osho Di Solo, Local Government. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you for, 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 for honoring this invitation. And then we'll go on to the next on the agenda, which um, is the opening remarks by the LOC chairman. We would, before we go there, we won't hesitate to welcome our guest speaker, person of Professor. Ehosa Osaye, we appreciate you, sir. The Nigerian the Gen Director General, Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. We appreciate you. We also say happy congratulations to you, sir, on the anniversary that you've been the 60th anniversary you've been having all through, and for making our time to be here. We know it's it's supposed to be a tight corner for you, but you you made out that time. We celebrate you and we say thank you very much, sir. So we we'll call on the Chairman LOC, person of Dr. DK Mike, for um, his opening remarks. A round of applause, please. Good morning, everybody. Once again, I want to welcome everybody, our guests and um, our visitors. We want to welcome you to Corona College of Education, the best uh, private college of education in Nigeria. And uh, once again, I want to say, we want to congratulate our guest lecturer for the 60th uh, anniversary of the organization. We we'll say happy anniversary. Before I do my introductory speech, it's gonna be very, very short. I want to tell the world what Corona College of Education is all about. Corona College of Education is um, a wonderful institution with the aim to raise new breed of teachers for the, for the world. The sustainable development goal for, if we look at the targets from A to H, we, we, only, we agree with me that we have a shortage of quality teachers. And we've been mandated by, by the year 2030, we should be able to have over 30 million teachers. And Corona College of Education is one institute that is also that has keyed into that to ensure that we're not just only going to raise teachers, we are going to raise new breed of teachers that will be able to suit the present uh, dispensation that we have technology, both the soft skills and technology and hard skills and technology. At Corona, we have our NCE program, which is Nigerian Certificate Examination, which runs for one for, for three years and it's a full-time program. We have our, other, our NCE students, we have the NCE student one, two, three, and we agree with me that it has been a wonderful um, program that they've experienced and that has been one of the best experience that um, 
they've, um, they've had in this uh, institution. And also we have a program we were called professional, professional Diploma in Education. In Nigeria today, we have teachers who are not certified to teach, but they are in our education system. They are teaching. We can't tell them to leave the job, but what we can only do is to train them to be able to be certified. And how can they be certified? They can only be certified by the Teacher Registration Council of Nigeria, TRCN. And for them to be certified, you must have a degree in education. And they don't have. They have degree in other sectors and they are in the education sector. We, here in the education sector, we accepted them. So we, are, we have a program for 12 months. 12 months. It went, it's not 12 months, one day. Not 12 months, one hour. Not 12 months, one minute exactly 12 good months that we're going to run the program together with TRCN organization and it will be for 12 months we take them through the, the rudiments of teaching what to teach how to teach the methodologies and other things involved so we also this program is for 12 months for them at the end of the program they will be certified and uh, they will sit for the TRCN exams after if they as, uh, if they pass and uh, on the day of graduation, they'll be issued two certificates. So one, the Corona College of Education, Professional Diploma in Education, and the Teacher Registration Council Certification. We also have um, our Professional Diploma in Early Childhood and Early Childhood Care and Development Education. It also runs for 12 months. It is for our child uh, educators, are those in the early childhood, that are teachers, that are practitioners. We have the head teachers in early years, in early schools. We have our, uh, our head of schools, our line managers, anybody that associated that have anything connected, they have anything to be connected with early years. This is the best um, program for you to be able to know how to know about child development, child psychology, and other things that involves the child. So we are telling you that you can also come along and it's just for 12 months. We, it, it's going to be wonderful and a very lovely experience. Also in Corona College of Education, the best private college of education in Nigeria, we also offer advanced diploma in educational leadership and management. Advanced diploma is for teachers as well, also for health of schools, also for um, educational leaders, educational secretaries, our, our educational directors, and also even our provosts, our rectors, anybody who is a leader an administrator, a manager in the education sector. This is a program for you. It is, we need to know about the emotional intelligence of a leadership or that rudiment that concern how to lead and what, how to lead, what to do in any situation about diversity, leading in diversity, leading in change and also in inclusion. So this is a program for all every one of us in that category. So that's all about Corona College of Education. And I hope to see you. Our academic section have started and it will run till September, we started in October, and it will run till September. We still have room for you till, um, the, till probably December 17 or end of this year. So thank you and God bless you. Now to my speech. I'm so happy that I want to listen to one of the great scholars that I've always, always heard him from far. See him on the TV, hear him on the radio, talk about issues, international issues, political issues. But today he's here to tell us about the, the, the security issues. You all agree with me that the school is supposed to be a safe home for the child. The school is supposed to be a safe place for the child, the second home of the child. But it's unfortunate, the school is now a threat. It's now a threat. The, the child is uh, it's afraid to attend school due to our peculiar situation in Nigeria. And it has generated to a stage that we have to speak out. It has generated to a state that we have to know where are we coming from? How do we get here? And that is why we, we don't want to waste time. I have to um, let this, this, let this rule for us to call in our erudite scholar, a great scholar, um, a very wonderful uh, lecturer, and I can tell you, sir, you are some of your students and online. One of them called, so one of them is even in Lagos. He, I believe he will soon be here. He said, uh, one of them also happens to be a member of this uh, committee, Dr. Shinowo. You taught her 
uh, political science those days in UI. She, she ought to be here. She traveled. And they all want to listen to you. They are all online. So that is why we, we know he is the best for this. That will be able to teach us, tell us the emergent security issues in Nigeria, the facts, the puzzles, the remedies, and uh, the, the remedies in, the, in the, the education sector. I hereby um, wrote to introduce the program and hereby set the uh, ball rolling for us to hear one of the great scholars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. DK. We appreciate that. What a wonderful speech from the LOC. Um, we still have some other dignitaries to recognize. Um, recognize the need to recognize the representative Education Secretary Shomolu Local Government Authority in person of Alaji Lawal. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. And also Education District 6, Representative S.A. Owolabi, Representative to the Tutor General. Thank you very much sir, for being around. Um, we we'll also acknowledge the presence of the Director Special Duties of Lagos State Polytechnic in person of Mrs. Aderonke Ige, representing the Rector. We appreciate you, man. Thank you for being around today. And then we we'll also look out for the the Dean, Faculty of Education, Unilag, prof, in person of Professor Mo, Monday Basi Ubaha. I, I beg your pardon, sir. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you all for coming around. And also, we would like to um, look back again to the, um, the chairman of the occasion as well, in person of Dr. Wahab Ademola, Wahab Ademola Aziz. We appreciate you, sir. That's the Provost CEO, Federal College of Education, Technical Akoka. You're welcome, sir. Um, we also the representative um, of Topmost College of Education, um, representing the Provost. You're welcome. You're highly welcome. Thank you for thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. So now we'll go back to um, the opening remarks by the chairman. We want to get the opening remarks by the chairman, person of Dr. Wahab Ademola Aziz, the provost CEO, Federal College of Education Technolo Technical, Akoka. Thank you very much, sir. A round of applause for him, please. Um, the chairman of the uh, board of trustee, I hope I'm correct, of um, Corona College, the approvals of Corona College and other principal officers, then the guest lecturer of today, distinguished guests, staff, students, members of the press, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first of all uh, apologize that uh, I came a bit late. Um, Friday is always uh, not a good day for me uh, as a person to attend a, a, a public function because uh, it's the last day of the, of the week where you have uh, too much presence in the office. Um, maybe that as it may, uh, I feel that um, I must be physically present here uh, for one or two reasons, uh, because uh, this is my first time of entering this premises. 
and I'll, um, and I know that uh, for the past two, three years, there has been a kind of um, what I would call is it bilateral relationship between Federal College of Christian Technical Coca and um, Corona College, even though, even though not officially. Uh, because uh, the immediate past provost uh, is the uh, staff of the college, that's Dr. Bion Martins. And then when he left, uh, the college management or the board of trustees was gracious enough to also appoint the current provost from our college. Uh, the first College of Christian Technical in Nigeria. Um, I feel that at it having done that for us, that it's also proper that I attend this program uh, physically. Uh, I appreciate the management of the college uh, for deeming it fit to nominate me uh, as the chairman of this uh, uh, lecture. Um, Having said that, I'll be very brief in my opening remarks so that I know the program has started. Uh, we are talking, the, the topic of today's lecture is um, emergent security issues in Nigeria. The facts, pursuits, and uh, remedies for education sector. Um, I want to also plead that maybe the subsequent lectures should also include the students in their large number. Uh, because uh, um, if you look at the age bracket here, and I'm sure that uh, uh, many of us here, um, maybe will have lived, will have been born maybe in the 60s, in the 70s, um, um, where we enjoyed better education system, educational system especially most of us who are from the southwestern part of Nigeria. Um, then education was made compulsory for our parents. And I was listening to the Professor Tomori's uh, this, which is also on social media. We had the old professor was crying for Nigeria because of the sorry situation we have found ourselves. And uh, why I would have wanted more of our students to be here because uh, this lecture uh, concerns them most. Because if you look at um, the rate of <clears throat> insecurity, it's very common among the youth. I mean, those who perpetrate it, all kinds of uh, insecurity, you know, uh, because of the negligence of the state the negligence of the state on the citizens of the country. Uh, Nigeria as a country um, used to have one of the best educational systems in the world, not even in Africa. But now we are struggling. I don't know which position we have because of negligence here and there. And um, because of that negligence for a long time, citizens are not catered for. And, um, Everybody just, was just struggling to make ends meet, and that the the leadership, the particular leadership, um, does not see education as a weapon to conquer the world, to also liberate its citizens, and in the process, people are struggling to live, and that um, is is a very debatable topic very debatable, uh, depending on uh, which side of the device you are looking at it from. Uh, because uh, insecurity did not just start like that. But there are people, yes, who use their intellect to also perpetrate uh, all kinds of things. But those are conscious, you know, uh, but most of the things, because, because you see that people just want to survive, especially the youth, because of the negligence. Um, then it also affects our um, educational system uh, because um, we train youth, students after graduation that don't even know where to go to. 
you know, we have to work and so on and so forth. And um, yes, this is a college education. And this is privately owned, uh, which is a boost to Nigerian education system uh, because the public education system um, is not at its best as at now. So there's that need for that stiff competition uh, between the public and private sector. Even though public sector, I mean, um, private sector, especially the institutions, rely heavily on um, teachers from public institutions. Because uh, if you need experienced teachers, experienced professors, experienced um, PhD holders, professionals, uh, you need to look towards the director of public schools to be able to get them. That's a fact. Even though the private institutions are also trying to also bridge new set of intellectuals, which is good for the country. So we need that stiff competition. Um, going back to the topic, we all know the state of security in the country and that um, you have to make, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your family. And that's the situation. And that as education, educational institution, we need to, we need to also be involved in how to also secure ourselves, our family, our properties, our institutions, and that there are so many ways in which we can do that. I'm not sure that the guest lecturer will also delve into that. Uh, but more importantly, before I just uh, round up, I want to say that um, I want to say that Nigeria as a country needs to invest more in education, both at public and private level, so that we can also move faster to be able to catch up uh, with the rest of the world. And what I mean is that um, um, our curriculum has to be, you know, well-focused uh, so that we don't force students to offer courses that are not necessarily, you know, um, adding value to our situation. I'm saying that, I also argue that most of our institutions, universities and polytechnic, we run almost the same curricula, which I don't think is the best for the country. An institution that's located in a particular community, a particular state, should have a focus on what type of courses it can run to also, you know, add value to that system. So um, the issue of security, I know will be overcome by the time we're able to also create more awareness, education, and the youth especially. I also trained to be able to also develop uh, certain things on their own, especially the technology. And that's where we have the, the whole world is, is now. So that our curriculum should be tailored to us, making sure that our students are involved in technology. There's no magic in technology. We have technology in all, in all, in all, in all curriculum, in all courses. So that even if somebody is offering a subject, a course like Yoruba, Igbo, Igbo or Aousa, or, it doesn't mean that uh, you must be a medical student or an engineering student before you can also understand the basic you know, rules of technology. But it must be consciously inculcated in our curriculum so that uh, we can overcome some of these challenges. And lastly, as educationists, I want to plead that, please, um, we should not stay aloof because we are intellectuals in preferring solutions to the problems that are facing the educational system in Nigeria. If we leave our educational system in the hands of Nigerian politicians alone, then we are doomed. So we need to be ahead in providing intellectual solutions so that we can get the best and secure our country. 
Thank you very much. A round of applause again, please. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for that. Okay, um, right about now, just, just a quick um, acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge the presence online of Dr. Joe Mekiluwe, Dr. Jumoke Olani Pekun, Dr. Olaiton Kuku, Dr. Tunde Lawal, Dr. Odeyemi Bamidele, and Dr. Martin Obinya, immediate past um, provost, Mr. Ade Dotson Sulaiman, Chairman, CSET Can um, Governing Council. We appreciate you all. Thank you very much for, um, for joining us on this program. Now we'll do a welcome address by the provost of the college, in person of Dr. Olajimo Kemekeluwe. Please, a round of applause, please. Um, the chairman of the occasion, Dr. Wahab Ademola Aziz, my very own provost. Thank you for making time out of your busy schedule to be here. The distinguished guest lecturer, Professor Egosa Osagai. He will still have to correct us on how to pronounce the name. The chairman of the governing council, Corona College of Education online, is online with us. Um, let me quickly say that this is a hybrid event. So we have quite a number of participants joining us online and they will be recognized from time to time. The chief executive officer of the Corona Schools Trust Council. Um, I can see here seated with us today, representatives of different tiers of education. We have the representative of the education secretary from Shomolu here seated. From um, district six, we have the representative of the tutor general here seated. We have the dean of the faculty of education here seated. We have representatives from sister colleges, private colleges, um, topmost college, you're here seated, I know. Adeniro Ogunsoya College of Education is here seated. Representative of the Rector Lagos State Polytechnic is here seated. I welcome you all. The representative of the Yaba College of Technology, a personal friend of mine, Dr. Taiwo Momia from secondary school. You're welcome to the occasion. Um, we have so many people here seated already. The college management, registrar, deans of schools, the heads of the Corona Schools joining online, distinguished guests, staff and students, Corona College of Education, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this public lecture organized by Corona College of Education in Lukwaju, Lagos. Today's lecture is the third in the series of lecture series designed to generate discourses around issues in education with the effect of galvanizing sustainable change in the education sector in Nigeria today. At today's event, joining us virtually and on-site are distinguished guests from within and outside academia, from supervisory bodies, ministries, and representatives of government uh, education districts, proprietors, heads of schools, administrators, teachers, students, and well-meaning Nigerians from all nooks and crannies of the society. The topic for today's lecture, emergent security issues in Nigeria, the facts, the puzzles and remedies for the education sector was chosen to address the numerous security threats confronting the nation's educational institutions, ranging from the primary to the secondary to tertiary schools especially in recent times. These are apparently challenging times for all stakeholders in education and for government, as the nation's institutions have become the target of attacks from enemies within and without. Though insecurity is a global burden, ranging from kidnappings to banditry, militancy, terrorism, civil unrest, riots, 
environmental hazards, armed robbery, unprovoked shootings. The spate of attacks on schools in Nigeria in recent times is nevertheless unprecedented. Let me quickly, I'm not trying to take over the lecture, but let me just remind us of recent events across this year, last year of um, insecurity matters all over the country. In 2014, we all woke up to hear the sad story of about 276 students in Chibok, in Borno State, kidnapped and ferried away into the night. From Chibok, we moved on in 2018 to the tale of Dapchi girls, about 116 of them in Yobe, all carried away by abductors. And then in 2021, we come down to the recent months, in March, 300 students from the government girls secondary science school in Zamfara were again carried away. And then in July, we had the story of 126 students from Bethel Baptist Secondary School, again, carried away. In November, the University of Abuja woke up to hear that some of their staff and children in the quarters were also abducted. As if those stories are far away, right here in Lagos State in Ekwe, I think sometime in 2017, we had the story of about 11 students of the Lagos State um, School. I can't remember the name of the school now. Yeah, Government College in Ekwe, carried away in 2017. I'm sure they are back home now. UNICEF establishes that over 1,400 students have been kidnapped so far in recent years. And in 2021 alone, we have had over 20 attacks on schools in Nigeria. There have been reports, like I said, of teachers, lecturers, and students abducted from schools. There have been reports in recent times of teachers beaten up by their students or by hired thugs that parents sent to school to beat up teachers because the uh, teachers disciplined their children. We've had reports of people attacking, bullying, and inflicting harm on classmates, leading to death. It's all in the news. Again, last week, there were reports of students in Edo State, I think Idogbo Secondary School, who went on a rampage and destroyed so many properties in the school. These are all part of the tales, the narrative of insecurity in our nation today. And this calls for a gathering such as this. We can't as stakeholders fold our hands because it seems and it appears to me that schools and indeed education is fast becoming an endangered species. And all of us must wake up and attend to these matters as soon and as fast as we can. Ladies and gentlemen, let me quickly say at this juncture that today's guest lecturer was carefully selected also to address these concerns. Professor Egosa Osage is an erudite scholar and his profile will reveal later that um, there is no better person to treat today's topic. If I go down memory lane very fast in 2018, I reached out to the distinguished professor to deliver a lecture at Federal College of Education at Coca. And uh, he was so humble in his approach. He was so approachable and he promised he would be there. We kept on interacting. I think he flew in from South Africa just a few days before the event. He arrived at the college well before anyone was seated in the hall, delivered a well-packaged lecture. I thought you were going to... <laughs> delivered a well-received lecture that threw up a lot of issues. So I'm glad you're here again today. I'm glad you accepted this um, invite and we look forward to your paper, which I believe will generate issues that will undoubtedly help all stakeholders to chart the way forward and to influence public and private security decisions at such a time as this. Ladies and gentlemen, I expect and I believe that the lecture will interrogate among other issues addressing these questions. One, why the sudden increase in armed attacks on schools? What is the root of escalating insecurity in Nigeria in the first place? How ready 
how prepared are schools to confront the emerging threats? What are the roles of government, proprietors, administrators in crisis prevention amidst the realities of inadequate security apparatus, delayed responses, and other compromises of Nigeria's security landscape? What can we do to secure our schools? And then what are the implications of sustained attacks on schools? Statistics reveal that currently Nigeria has more than 10 million children out of school. These attacks can only worsen that situation, you will agree with me. So these are the questions and much more than that, that we expect to find answers to at this lecture. Distinguished guests, before I conclude the speech, let me once again specially recognize the presence of the chairman of our governing council, Mr. Dr. Suleiman MFR, and other members of the college council already online, and the CEO of the CSTC, Mrs. Adeyoni Adishino, for their warm support, and to members of the local organizing committee, headed by Dr. Mike DK, for a job well done. To all participants, I welcome you all. Happy listening, and God bless. Thank you very much, Dr. Olajumo Kemekiluwa, that's the Provost Corona College of Education. Now we're going to the main lecture proper, but before we go in, um, I want everybody online, we'll all um, drop our questions. All questions should be dropped at the chat box. While in here, we'll have papers passed across for everybody to write down their questions. But before we have our guest lecturer, we'll have a citation of the lecturer by, um, Mrs. Edith Omoson, the Programs Marketing Manager, Corona College of Education Consult. Citation on Professor Egosa Emmanuel Usagai. Professor Egosa Emmanuel Usagai holds a PhD in political science from the University of Ibadan, where he is a professor of political science. He was appointed Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. He was appointed Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs by the President, Commander in Chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in 2021. Before then, Professor Sagai was Vice Chancellor of Ibinaja University, Okada, a position he held for a record of 14 years. Professor Sagai. Sagai was the 2019 Claude Ake Chair at Uppsala University in Nordic Africa Institute, Sweden, and a Fellow of Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Studies in South Africa. Our guest lecturer was 2017 Vanslai Slabat Professor of Politics and Sociology at the University of Cape Town. And in 2014, Emeka Ayoko Chair of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. His Iron Chair inaugural lecture in 2014 became the first inaugural lecture by a Nigerian in the history of University of London. Before, I hope you, I was thinking you should clap. Before up an appointment at Ibnidia University, he was a leader of the Ford Foundation funded program on ethnic federal studies and the director of Center for Peace Conflict Studies at the University of Ibadan. Between 1994 and 1998, Professor Osagai was professor and head of Department of Political Science at University of Transkei, South Africa. He has be also been a visiting professor, a fellow, distinguished senior scholar at Carter Center of Emory University, USA, University of Liberia, University of South University of Cape Town, South Africa, and Nordic Africa Institute, Uppsala, Sweden. University of Ulster, Northern Ireland, Northwestern University, USA, University of Cambridge, UK, Dartmouth College, USA, and Yale University, USA. The distinguished professor was a Rockefeller, a Rockefeller Fellow, and most recently a MacArthur Fellow. He has also won several awards nationally and internationally, and he is a member of several learned societies and educational board. 
Professor Sagai served as a chair of the panel on quality assurance assessment, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, chair of Pan-African Working Group on Building Institutional Effectiveness in Africa, hosted by the Institute of Global Dialogue, South Africa, and Federal Trust Fund, UK, between 2005 and 2006, UN expert on Somalia, amongst many others. He has been a member of technical advisory panel and network on parliaments and parliamentary institutions of African Capacity Building Foundation, Harare, Zimbabwe, since 2003. Between 1998 and 2004, he was Africa's representative on steering committee on civil society governance project at the University of Sussex, UK, between 2005 to, sorry, between 2006 and 2007. He was a member of the Central for Advisory Review Group, Development Research Center on Citizenship, Participation and Accountability at the same university. He served on Sterling Committee of Consortium of Development Partnerships, a successful model of North-South intellectual collaboration that involved institutions from North America, Europe, and Africa between 2005 and 2012. In 2002, Professor Sagai was a consultant to the African Development Bank country, African Development Bank country mission to Zambia and produced the country's governance profile. Between 2001 and 2003, he was a member of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Political Affairs in, in Nigeria and is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Nigerian Development Forum. He has consulted for USAID, DFID, UNDP, and the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, and is the founder and chair of the governing board for community relations and conflict resolution in Ibadan. Professor Osagai has published extensively on governance, state politics, globalization in books and journals and attended over 300 conferences, workshops and seminars in different parts of North America, Europe, Asia and Africa. In addition, he has published well over 150 articles in books and learned journals, learned international journals. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. <laughs> Professor Emmanuel. Thank you, please be seated. Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for this session. Let me especially thank my dear sister, Dr. Lajboke Mekiliwa, who has been um, a close friend since 2018 and congratulate you for your appointment as provost of the Corona College of Education. I, I was struck, you know, when you rendered your anthem and I had to turn to her uh, because I thought, you know, um, that's an anthem I had heard many times um, and ask me how I um, have heard that anthem. My, my grandson and my granddaughter uh, as students, pupils actually, at the Corona School, um, you know, and, and, and therefore um, I, I, felt, I felt really at home. Uh, so let me congratulate the Corona Group for the wonderful things you're doing. We expect that um, in the next couple of months, you would add many more tertiary institutions to what you're doing. It's my pleasure to be here um, and thank you for congratulating us, the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, which I am privileged to head at this time, is 60 years old and um, we have rolled out the drums um, and we've been celebrating. Uh, Diamond Jubilees are useful landmarks and uh, you cannot but celebrate them. My task this morning is um, very well known to you. I want to share with you my thoughts on the topic that has been assigned to me, emergent security issues in our country, the facts, the puzzles, and the remedies for the education sector. Now, I am delighted because it is a subject that I think bears a review. We need to interrogate it. We need to understand it. 
and we need to know exactly what the problem is. And the hope is that once we are able to know what the problem is, then we should be able to search for pathways um, for addressing these kinds of issues. Let me straight away say first that what I'm going to do today would be to say to you the facts that you already know. I would even discuss with you the puzzles, uh, but those puzzles I will try to encapsulate and frame within theoretical reaches because um, what immediately has to be known is that these so-called emergent security issues are not isolated. They are not a Nigerian problem. They are problems all over the world, which is why even the United Nations has dedicated one day um, for the protection of the school environment, you know, from attack by sundry forces. Uh, so it's important to know that. And you know that for students of theory, the argument would be that it is the same propensities, the same dispositions, the same independent variables, the same factors, the same explanations um, that occur in a wide variety of cases, including Nigeria. And then of course, hopefully we'll discuss those remedies. Let me say that um, just to begin, when you say emergent security issues, the temptation to assume that these are new and evolving security threats would be there. Uh, but every student of history quickly realizes that many of the problems that we describe as emergent, you know, have deep roots, you know, in structural factors and historical factors. And in this case, you know, they may even be embedded. Um, therefore, I'm going to suggest to us that these emergent security issues have very deep roots and deep historical roots. Um, many of them going back to even the nature and the character of the state that we have in Nigeria and in the rest of the world. Um, so they are embedded in a sense, and therefore, if we don't understand that embeddedness, um, we wouldn't know what has hit us. I'd like to suggest you know, that these newer forms, these evolving newer forms you know, of insecurity are manifestations that are more contemporary of issues that have been with us for a long time. The second clarification, which is conceptual that I think is necessary is to say that once we say emergent security issues, um, the way we understand them today, what immediately comes to mind is Boko Haram, banditry, terrorism, armed robbery, and so on. It's as if the school is under attack from external forces, which is partly correct, maybe even largely correct, but that's not all of the story. You know, of course, that when we talk about whether old or emergent security issues in the education sector, we have internal dimensions of these problems of insecurity. As I speak about this, I'm sure you're all already thinking of cultism, you know, as an endemic problem. Um, that is not emergent at all. That is not something that hits us from outer space. It is something that happens within the space of the education sector. There's cultism and a great deal of it. Um, every day, there are new forms of cultism. Um, a long time ago, cultism was restricted to the institutions of higher learning. Uh, but today, cultism has gone down to the primary school level. Uh, I, I hope you know that. I hope you know that you know, we, we face very serious problems because if cultism begins from you know, the primary school and even the nursery school, these guys are going to cumulatively become hardened and they, they, by the time they graduate you know, uh, into the, um, the more serious levels and forms, God save our country. But, but I hope that we can have things that can address these kinds of issues and deal with them. For the period I was vice chancellor of a university, I was always struck each time we found problems with children. Um, well, our students would always be children, but especially those that 
got involved, you know, in drug abuse. And, you know, there was a particular student from Joss, um, who is now a distinguished pharmacist, by the way, um, that was a regular visitor to the vice chancellor's office. And each time I saw him, I would say, what is your problem? And he will tell me he's been doing this since he was in primary school. Or even to think of a medical student who has lost his life now. Now, who was this medical student? His father was a senator. He attended King's College. He was top of the range, you know, um, in Jamba and everything. And he got to the university and brought with him cultism. And we said to him, no, you have no space here. You, you're going to live here. Um, his father intervened and, you know, he said he was his only son. We should, you know, and so on and so on. And I, I, I counseled this young man. And I said, what is your problem? His confession, you know, um, brought tears to my eyes. He said to me, sir, you don't even know the extent of cultism on this campus that I know because I am an old student of King's College. All the old students of King's College in this university are in the same cult. I'm sorry I'm mentioning names. I hope somebody is not going to say, you know, um, you're spoiling our name and therefore, well, but I hope I am protected because this is an academic forum. Um, we have the Chatham House rule that allows you to go ahead and say the things that you need to share as long as this is for an academic audience. So I'm covered. Provost, you protect me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, so he said to me that that's where it started from. And that, you know, when he got to this university, he just, you know, it was like, I've been told that, you know, witches are wizards when they attack people, they leave marks on their faces and their foreheads. So wherever you go, the other witches and wizards can continue from there. I'm sure you have heard that story before. Now, each time I asked my mom if this was the case, she would say, I'm sure you're asking me because I'm a witch. But I said, no, you're not a witch. I don't know. So how did I expect her to know anyway? But this young man said to me, as soon as he got to the university and he saw these guys, it was back to business. We expelled him and, you know, he left the university. The father begged, would brought him back. And then this was after one year. He told me there were more students from that school who came from the same source, you see? And so it was continuity. To cut a long story short, we expelled him a final time. His father, you know, got so heartbroken. He took pages in the newspapers and disowned him. And um, not too long after, he was sentenced to death for, for armed robbery you know, of all things. And, you know, may God bless his soul wherever he is. But, you know, these, these, are, these are stories that sound bizarre and extreme, but they remind us that these so-called emergent security issues have been with us for a long time. And, and they are getting, you know, more, you know, deep-rooted, you know, as the days have gone by. But for the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to talk about attacks from outside. I'm going to talk about, you know, um, the emergent security issues that are beyond our control. Um, the ones that hit us, you know, like COVID-19. Um, you know, President Donald Trump used to say that COVID-19 is the unseen enemy. When you fight that war, you really don't have control, isn't it? So the ones we don't have control over, these are the ones I want to talk about. Um, so let me begin with the puzzles. And these puzzles, I want to address them theoretically and comparatively. You see, all of the things that are happening in Nigeria are happening to many other countries, not only in Africa, but beyond Africa. Just think of it. But in Africa, we, we seem to have contextual, contextual um, specificities um, that make this sense fairly predictable and well-known. Um, whether you are looking at you know, the situation in La Côte d'Ivoire, or you're looking at the situation in Zimbabwe, you're looking at the situation in Mozambique, you're looking at Mali, you're looking at Niger, you're looking at Mauritania, you're looking at Cameroon, 
Um, you're looking at Botswana, you're looking at Kenya, you're looking at Uganda, you're looking at Ghana, you're looking at all of these countries. These things resonate very well. Um, so people who hear stories from Nigeria can find themselves in those same stories. And the question would be, why, why is this happening? Now, you will know that the state forms, and by state forms, I mean uh, the countries we belong to. I'm sure you know you belong to a country. You're a citizen of Nigeria, which is very good. I'm a citizen of Nigeria. Um, but there are other countries like Nigeria. There's Benin Republic. There's Togo. There is all of these countries. Now, what is common to all of these countries in this part of the world is that they were not countries that came into existence in any organic sense. These are countries that were brought together in the most you know, um, um, unusual forms. Uh, they call them artificial countries. Artificial to the extent that those who decided to put these countries together didn't come to ask the people, are these the countries you want to belong to? They, they simply took out their rulers and their pens and drew boundaries and then gave these boundaries names and said, from now on, you will be called Nigeria, uh, you'll be called the Gold Coast, you'll be called, you know, and so on. Uh, that's how the countries in Africa came into being. They came into being through what we call the colonial acts of creation, colonial acts of creation. Now, when the colonial masters, I hate to use masters because it would suggest that they are still in charge. When the colonial tyrants, I, I think that's better. Uh, people who impose and inflict things on you cannot just be masters, they have to be tyrants. When the colonial tyrants um, decided to put these countries together, they had no maps to navigate through. They only had the historical experience, the sociological experience of their own societies and the kinds of states that they had. And so they thought you know, they could import these state forms and you know, graft them on these very unknown territories. So in a manner of speaking a little sophisticated English, that process involves what we call nostrums, nostrums. Nostrums are experiments that are performed, but whose outcomes are unpredictable and entirely unknown. Um, so I'd like to suggest to you that never in the history of the world did any state process such as the one that gave rise to Nigeria ever take place. These were experiments that were performed by people who didn't expect them to succeed. I'm sure many of the colonial tyrants that were in places like Nigeria that long ago, going back to the period of 1899, uh, down to 1914, and down to 1938, and so on and so on. If you wake them up from their death today and say, this is Nigeria, they say, you mean Nigeria survived? It, it must be a miracle yeah, because no country has ever had this trajectory. No country has ever had this trajectory. Let me, let me tell you about the, the greater mystery and maze of this trajectory. In many countries, the guys, the colonial tyrants, I mean, also redefined us and they profiled us and they classified us and gave us new identities, the things we didn't have before. In places like Kenya, in places like Uganda, the administratively created tribes and ethnic groups and labeled them. The Baluya group in Kenya is a good example of what the colonial constructors did. They constructed new identities. In Nigeria, and you should better listen to this, in Nigeria, we did not have the Yoruba ethnic group before Nigeria came into being. We did not have the Igbo ethnic group before Nigeria came into being. All these groups that we want to fight and die for today 
had their identities constructed only within the framework of Nigeria as a country. Many of us today claim to be Northerners and Southerners and so on and so on and so on. These are colonial creations. We were never Southerners or Northerners, is that clear? So even the identities that we claim to have today are artificial identities. And it's in the process of their consolidation and deepening that all of these fissures, all of these you know, uh, conflicts and all of these things have emerged. The point simply is this, that to hold a country like Nigeria together, it's a very difficult task. Because of its artificiality that gets deepened by the day, the only thing that could have helped and held Nigeria together was the fact that we had a common enemy in our colonial tyrants. And so we fought for independence. In that fight, we had a veneer of solidarity and even togetherness. But you know the history. That past has receded in memory and we have the reality staring us. Students of anthropology call this the theory of segmentary opposition. Segmentary opposition simply means that A and B and C and D can get together when they have a common enemy. But once they have gotten rid of the common enemy, they fall on themselves and begin to tear each other apart because you know, they cannot find the common enemy anymore. South Africa is slowly beginning to unravel in that manner because apartheid is gone. So what held all of those groups together no longer exists. So now the competition has started. So all the things happening to Nigeria and happening in other African countries, I'd like to suggest to you, are responses to the artificiality of the state, the imperfection of that state, the lack of legitimacy of that state, and the jostle now to recreate the state in the image of the people who are saying, who owns this state? Do you understand? So the logic of whether it is terrorism or it's insurgency or it's separatist agitation, all of these things that are all over Africa are simply saying, this state that you gave to us is not our state. Now we want our state and we want ourselves within this state. In Mexico, they used to say, those peasants will say, never again in Mexico without us. So this is the struggle in Nigeria. Whether you call it equity, whether you call it for justice, whatever it is. So when you have the turbulence of a state rebirth, of a regeneration of a state, these forms of insecurity are inevitable. Exactly. Yes, because it's like, we are, we are struggling all over again uh, to create a state that we all own. And if we are all going to own that state, then of course the struggles must be not so equal because we are not equally endowed, okay? Now, let me be a little more specific and talk about the puzzles of the education sector. Proponents of modernization theory, which is, you know, this is what, you know, we had in the social sciences in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s. And um, there is a new form of modernization theory, which you would find in neoliberal reforms. And by the way, let me also just tell you, you know, we talked about our state forms being highly experimental and being nostrums because they have never been done anywhere else in the world. I hope you heard that. The experimentation has not ended. Today we have reforms. I'm sure you've heard of reforms. Go and devalue your currency, which is what the Naira is suffering every day now. Go and reduce your workforce. Go let the state now you know, be very lean. The state should no longer take charge of many things. Um, and yet we are the ones who come back to hold the state, you know, um, for failure. Even though the theory says the state should recede 
and let the private sector take over. You, you know this. This is neoliberal wisdom. The one that says, don't even invest so heavily anymore in public education. Let the private sector run education. It's efficiency that we are looking for. In the name of transparency and accountability and institution building, we are again going through reforms that are nostrum reforms. They have never been done anywhere else in the world. So the new experiments that we are having to conduct and you know, live with in this part of the world are experiments that are unprecedented, okay? So we are still in the throes of what we don't know. But modernization theory had said in the areas of social mobility and social mobilization, the surest variable, the most assured variable for progress is literacy. Literacy. You want to conquer poverty, you want to conquer ignorance, you want to conquer disease, you want to grow prosperity, you want people to you know, have better well-being, to be empowered, and, and you want them to you know, live well and, and enjoy a good life. In short, you want to empower people, you want to ensure human security, invest in literacy, okay? Now, for students of social mobility, and we all know it, many of the people today who have um, a sense of that old history as our provost was trying to remind us, are people whose parents were not so rich. In fact, many of them were not rich at all. They were poor. You know, but they, 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 they sacrificed everything that they had just to see that their children went to school. Why were they doing this? Because there was evidence that if your child was able to get education, it would be farewell to poverty. Now, I, I, I come from Benin City and, um, you know, I, the street where I grew up. I've always said to myself, you know, God is very kind. Um, God is not the respecter of persons, but, you know, in every house, you know, in, in, in Benin, you know, on my street, I found that even from my generation, every house could count between three and 10 graduates, you know, whether it was, you know, college of education graduate or polytechnic graduate or university graduate. But I tell you that fact in itself transformed the whole street and all the families that are there. There is no substitute for education other than the one that I have seen. They say, if you think education is too expensive, try ignorance. But nobody wants to try ignorance. And that's the power of the theory of social mobility, which is always about upward mobility. You know, so it is, it is a transformatory you know, um, um, thing that education does. Literacy takes people from you know, poverty, abject poverty, takes them from ignorance, takes them from disease, takes them, not just taking them, it liberates them, it liberates them, it emancipates them, and takes them to a point where they can be fully empowered and be on their own. That's social mobility, social mobilization, modernization theory. Now, in 2004, Paul Collier and Anka Heffler published a landmark article in the Oxford Academic Papers titled Greed and Grievance in Civil War. Greed and Grievance in Civil War. What were they trying to do? Uh, by the way, Paul Collier is the author of the theory um, that talks about the resource costs, resource costs. Um, you know, resource costs comes from what the Netherlands suffered, you know, um, when they suddenly got into wealth, um, when they found oil, 
the Netherlands, you know, abandoned all of the productive sectors and the things that made them worthwhile before. And even the, 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 the capitalist class became very leisurely and they now started to depend on the rents from oil. Um, and, you know, it's called the Dutch disease. I'm sure you have heard the Dutch disease. It's called the Dutch disease. It, it leads you to a feeling of being very wealthy and every person is, you know, happy ever after. As long as oil flows, everything is well. Um, but you see, that Dutch disease uh, takes you away from your productive capacities. Um, and, you know, as Collier argued later, it leads to the curse of war and conflict. So wherever you find these extractive resources, especially oil, um, uranium, and so on, and especially when they are located in one part only of the country, conflict and war are inevitable. Now, so Collier and Heffler were asking, what are those underlying factors? What are the independent variables? What are the explanatory factors you know, for civil war that we can find? And they identified several factors, but for a purpose in this lecture, the one that they thought was key was education. Why? Because they say there is a positive correlation between the dropout rate of school children and young adults and conflict and war. So they argue that in places where children are illiterate, okay, where school rates are very low and where therefore there are high levels of illiteracy, you have an enabling environment for conflict and for war. Okay? And they had their correlations to show that countries that have high levels of literacy don't get immersed in war. Do, do, do you know why that is crucial? If you go to school, and, and I, like of, I like for all of us to take note of this. If you go to school, as many of us have done, the kinds of risk you take will be lower. Is that right? People who have gone to school just don't plunge into the unknown. They tend to become more conservative the more education they have. The more education you have, the more careful you are. So it's not a surprise, therefore, that the guys who go into ritual killings, who go into Yahoo Yahoo, who go into all of these things, are either school dropouts or people who didn't go to school. And those among them who went to school didn't go to school well. No, you can tell. It's, it's true. You know, they didn't go to school well. Um, they, they may have gone to school, but school didn't go through them. We know this. So Collier and Heffler then said, in all the countries they studied that were at war, where there was terrorism, where there was chronic conflict, the first thing that the perpetrators hit schools. Schools. Because the more they close the schools, the easier it is for them to recruit. Do you understand this connection now? Because very easy for them to recruit. Every, every child out of school is a potential terrorist. Every child out of school is a potential armed robber. Every child out of school is a potential rapist. This is the reality. And it's proven by theory. It's not the Gosa Saga that is propounding this. This is Collier and Heffler. I mean, they had all of those correlations and the simulations, and they arrived at this very painful conclusion. And then they said, because of this, you can understand the ideology of Boko Haram. 
Boko Haram, just in case you don't know, means Western education is evil. Now, I'm sure you know of the origins of Boko Haram. You may not know. But part of what is now known is that Boko Haram had as initial recruits people who chose to leave universities to join because they had come to the conclusion that there was no value in education. So from this theory, you would say, is it any surprise therefore that schools are the targets for these attacks? The whole goal, the whole objective is to keep the schools in total and absolute disarray and to make it impossible for people to go to school. The, 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 most, the most virile segment of our population is made up of young people. So the more young people, male, that you're able to keep out of school, the more recruits you get. The more, and, and listen to this, the more young girls you're able to keep out of school, the more wives you make. Why is that crucial? You see, sex, rape, forced marriages, these are weapons of war. They are weapons of terrorism. They are weapons of banditry. Because it's an ideological indoctrination. There is a radicalization that teaches those people that when you have had children out of these situations of rape, of forced marriage, of illegal sex, the children that come out of that will continue the struggle. Do you understand? So terrorism is not only about the living right now, the indoctrination, the radicalization says, when you have succeeded in impregnating those women, if you die, your children will continue. So those Chibok girls, the Dapchi girls, all of these things they are doing, don't think they are happenstance. These guys also have a scientific approach, you know, to the attacks, okay? Now, from these theoretical frameworks, it is clear that what has hit the education sector is a very, very serious thing. It, it, is, not, it is not something that we can wish away. It is not something that we can decide you will sleep and the things will take over. They will change, they would not. But I'd like to suggest to you that there is an interface, there's a nexus, there's an intersection between the external forces and the internal forces that I talked about earlier on that would give rise to, is it cultism? Or is it, you know, just sheer indiscipline and banditry in our schools? Those people, even when the schools are open and not closed, are also easy recruits for these external forces. Do you understand? So little wonder, therefore, that in many schools that are close, especially those that are close to conflict zones, we have cells of banditry and cells of kidnapping and cells of terrorism within the four walls of those schools. If it is not direct recruitment, it is the process of radicalization. And how does radicalization come? You see this thing. The other day, my grandson was in the house and he said to me, Baba, he calls me Baba, which is good, I like it. He says, Baba, every time I have come here, I see that you don't even know how to use your TV. Now he's seven years, six years old. So I said, I don't know how to use my TV. He said, yes, you're not smart. You know, and I, 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 I was, you know, I, I like to be told so by a little boy because, you know, we learn every day. So I said to him, you're a professor, teach me. 
So he says, give me the remote that I gave to him. He did some things and said, you see, this is called Netflix. This is YouTube. So you don't have to be watching DSTV all the time. You can turn it. And I tell you, that changed my life forever because, <laughs> you, you know, who needs DSTV? No, I'm on Netflix. I mean, just all thanks. It is these same ways that these transfers, these ideological things get to the children beyond the walls of the school. So I say to school managers, the formal space of school is not all there is to learning. The children have uncontrolled spaces, you know, which they themselves have mastered. And they are able to receive from those uncontrolled spaces the kinds of things that would actually matter more to them, can change them completely. I have seen that little children watch cartoons. And many of us think those cartoons are just cartoons. They are not just cartoons. They are ideologically loaded cartoons. There are cartoons that teach racism. There are cartoons that teach bisexuality. There are cartoons that question God. There are cartoons that do all kinds of things, including the unimaginable. And these are things that our children get exposed to at such tender ages, beyond control. I'm sure as parents, you would find sometimes our children have a form of stubbornness that we cannot understand. Those forms of stubbornness come from the uncontrolled spaces that they have mastered, and they like them. OK? So the school environment is no longer just a physical space. It's not the dormitory. It's not the classroom. It's not the teacher. It's not the counselor. It's, it's, it's way beyond that. And COVID-19, you know, has been one of those unforeseen, you know, uh, like I say, Donald Trump says it's a war against an unseen, an unseen enemy. We, we don't know. I mean, today is Omicron. Maybe tomorrow it will be Omicron too. Nobody knows. It's, it's a world out there that we don't know. But in trying to adapt to this world, we have become more technologically savvy. And that means that you know, we are learning to do things even without seeing, without meeting physically. People now learn to work from home. Children now learn to be online. Uh, these things have positive sides, but they also have negative sides. Um, because they are exposing people to the good, the bad, and the ugly sides of technology. And all of these flows that come with technological facilitation. So the war today is a war that you know, involves the cyberspace. We also have to deal with it. And this is a cyberspace of YouTube and the other things, Instagram. You know what they call those things. You know that my grandson will tell me, Baba, you need to know these things. I mean, say the things I need to know at my age. <laughs> to join them. So I'm saying to us, this is to unravel the puzzle of what we are dealing with. And to see that, you know, we, 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 we have a lot more beyond our control than the ones within our control. So when we think of remedies in terms, for instance, of raising the levels of our school gates, that's, you know, what the eyes can see. I, I'll give you an example because, you know, um, I also like to preach sermons. And uh, let me tell you one of the sermons that I like to preach. You know, as human beings, uh, especially those of us who um, profess Christianity, 
um, we like to be with God, not to die. No, no, no. I mean, to be one with God, to be powerful. We like to be with God in control of the things that we do, isn't it? So that, for instance, we like to, um, to know who our enemies are, so we know how to deal with them. Yeah? We, 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 we like to know many things, you know, and so on. And, and thank God we know many things. But every human being quickly realizes, just in case you don't know, that what you know is less than one, million, one billion percent of what you need to live. Let me tell you how. Strong man, powerful man, Jim Jim Christian, speaks in tongues, does all of those things, you know. Don't you fall asleep. When you sleep, are you in control? Now think of it for one minute. I like to sleep and, you know, sometimes I can sleep for 12 hours. If you, if you allow me, I'll sleep for 24 hours. And, and, and I'm the first to tell you, oh, no, you know, we, you know, we can even pray. So the things you see are just a fraction of your life. Those enemies you know are the, the least that you can identify. Your real enemies, you don't even know them. You can't see them. That's why you must learn to be completely yielded to God. And say, as Galatians 2.20 says, that the life I now live, I live by faith. You see, because you cannot control anything. But that's not to say that we are hopeless. No, God forbid, we cannot be hopeless. So what remedies can we have? The first remedy that we must think of is to see how we can salvage our state. Because if the state is in a perpetual crisis and the state is in a perpetual state of turbulence and the state is not able to resolve its primary and fundamental problems, of ownership and legitimacy, then none of these things can be addressed. How can we make that state the kind of state we want? We have to make the state more accountable. Our leaders have to become more accountable. We have to choose our leaders ourselves. We must look for ways that make it possible for our leaders to be accountable to us. Accountability is not only about who becomes president or who becomes governor. It's also about who's provost, who's vice chancellor, who's head teacher, who's anything. They must be held to account. Now, a long time ago, Hillary Clinton, I'm sure you know her. Uh, since many Nigerians know more about people who are great people outside than we know about our people inside. Um, anyway, I'm sure you will know Hillary Clinton. At a point she said, you know, this movement for rights, human rights, I like, I like that movement. You know, it's, 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 it's part of our human heritage, part of the life that we live, you know, that we should have rights and freedoms. But then she says, you know, I think that rights should be organic. By which she meant, you know, when you think of the rights of the girl child, the rights of the boy, boy child, the rights of the wife, the rights of the mother, the rights of the, many people don't remember the rights of the father. It's only now we are beginning to bring the things back in. You know, it's assumed that because most societies are patriarchal, patriarchal the, the men are oppressive, they, they are domineering, so all the rights belong to them anyway. So these rights are meant to defend us against these very, very wicked men. These men that are oppressive. You know, just sit down and say, give me Pandadiam I mean, if he hasn't brought money. Just man, you know. So, um, but Hillary Clinton was saying, my worry is that one day the family is going to get so fast scattered that children will say, this is my space. The parents will say, the father, the father will say, this is my space. The mother will say, this is my space. The great child will say, yeah, you know. And she says, let us not overdo freedom. Let's, let's think of how freedom can be binding on everyone. 
Um, every person's right comes with a duty, a responsibility. And so, so I think that, you know, it is that reciprocity, that solidarity, um, that's that cohesion, that togetherness that defines, you know, familyhood and, and should also define the kinds of things that we're doing. So I like to say we need that overarching state, you know, a strong state, you know, that has been able to resolve these issues. It is when we have such a strong state that we can create our common spaces. Common, common, the things that are common to us. Uh, let me tell you how it works now. Today, if you are told that there are terrorist attacks in Kankara, you say, well, is there a problem? You see, it is there a problem? Now, in the part of the country where I come from, there's a common saying that once water touches the finger, it has touched the body. But we all pretend that what happens in the northeast of Nigeria is their problem. If you hear banditry, say, well, you know, we now have a motorcycle. So let them go and, you know, sort their problems out. Countries that have the kinds of states that I'm saying we should aspire to have are countries that are held together by common spaces and common interests. Knowing that what affects one affects all. Is that right? What a time to be fighting each other. It's one of the tragedies of our remedying situation. Because it's a time that calls for togetherness. Um, and let me tell you about the togetherness that I'm saying. The, the, the lady who read my citation um, and pronounced my name very well, thank you. She's, she's, because the provost has said I must teach, you know, I must teach you how to pronounce my name. She said she had a debate with you and somebody else to say it's not to Sage, even though he still called me Sage. You know, that's, that's, you know, but my name is Osage. Now, she, there's no way you would know that she's Edo because she bears a Yoruba name. In this place today, my mom is Undo. There's no way you would know because I don't bear her stamp. I, you know, so there's no way you would know my name is Ego Sasaga, and that's complexly Benin. Many of us here come from such dual backgrounds. This is the reality of Nigeria. And these dual backgrounds, you know, we run away from it and begin to say, ah, let us, let's go our separate ways. So where am I going to fall? Would I be, would I be Yoruba or, or Benin? There are those whose parents are so far flung apart. Mother Kalaba, Father Hausa, like Ahmed Musa, who plays football for Nigeria, is a Nigerian football captain. His mother is a doe. His father is from Kano. So where would he go to? So Nigeria at the floor shop is more coherent, it's more together than we make it appear. I haven't been to any part of Nigeria where I didn't see Nigeria in practice on display, fully on display. Just think of it. DK is here, and there are many DKs here. Yes? So which, which, which Biafra are we talking about? No, really. Those things that divide us are, as I explain it, a function of the disintegration of the state. So when we get that state together, many of these things will fall in place. Second point is that we now know, thanks to the Colliers and the Hefflers, that the solution to, well, both short-term and mid-term and long-term solutions that we're going to have to 
these emerging security situations hitting us from the outside cannot be through the barrel of the gun. That there is no way we are going to be able to do that. Our schools have to be reopened. The children have to get back to school. That's what the theory says. If they don't get back to school, we can only get worse. Just in case you don't know, in Boko Haram occupied territories, they have alternative governments. They exact taxes. People pay taxes to their local government. And for the women, they give them low, what do you call them? Those loans, SMEs. They run SMEs. They give you know, uh, credit to the women on better terms than what we offer as government, as, as people. They give them. And if those people had to vote for where they want to belong to, especially when it comes to who is able to secure us, they'll vote for Boko Haram. Is that right? So we need to counteract those spaces. We need to de-radicalize our people. We need to look for ways of halting this radicalization process and the indoctrination that is going on all the time. We must counteract them. Now, in this regard, I'll tell you the story of Antoine Makarenko because we are talking education. Anton Makarenko, um, you know, is from the present day Ukraine. In 1916, 1917, there was a Bolshevik revolution um, that, you know, um, gave rise to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR. And what was it about the Bolshevik revolution? In that revolution, the aristocracy, the monarchy, the czar of Russia was overthrown. And then you had a socialist regime. And those who had that regime, this is the meaning of radicalization and de-radicalization, I want you to understand. Those who had that revolution then said, there's a problem. We don't know how far we can go with this revolution if we are not able to get the people to be on our side, then this revolution will not last long. How do you get people to be on your side? These are people who are used to the old order, okay? Socialism is a radical departure from that old order. Socialism requires a different set of attitudes, a different set of beliefs, a different set of dispositions and behaviors. And therefore you needed to re-socialize the people. So they say, what should we do? Then they went to Anton Makarenko, who was a great psychologist. And they said to him, Makarenko, what should we do? Now, you know, it's also important that I highlight these anecdotes. Because in our country, we don't use experts and specialists. We use what did you call it, DK? The available. Uh, it's a country uh, where anything goes. That's all we do. But these guys, they went to Antoine Makarenko and they said to him, you know what? You, you have done extensive research. on this. Tell us how to go. Then he said to them, you know, I'm not giving up on the older generation, but they themselves are a threat to this revolution. <laughs> because if we are not careful, they will do all the things that will make this revolution fail. Our only hope is in their children. So let us take all children that are 10 and below and take them to the collectivities. And they did that. And they started to indoctrinate these children. So for one year, the children didn't come to see their parents. After one year and six months, they had an experimental sample. They sent them to their parents to say, let's see what has worked. These children came back to report their parents, to say, our parents are still of that old order. If they continue, this revolution is going to fail. They killed the parents, yes. 
Yeah, because you, 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 if you if you have a revolution, you want it to succeed. You, you cannot you cannot have those kinds of people. Now, this was the same thing that Israel, the state of Israel, you know, um, um, emulated when in 1947 Israel became. I hope you know that you know the historical and the biblical state of Israel, but the contemporary state of Israel only came into being in 1947. You know, when all of the Jews were encouraged to come back to the present territory where they are. And they were surrounded by enemies all around. And therefore, they were challenged to see how Israel was going to survive. The father of Israeli nationalism has a book called A State by All Means. Exactly. That summarizes the story of Israel. So what did they do? They created what they call kibbuzims. Kibbuzims are like the collectivities that Anton Makarenko had in Russia. And they took these children there to the kibbuzims. It's a rule in Israel. If you are not a product of the kibbuzims, you cannot hold office. Is that right? So we've heard of Moshe Dayan. You've heard of uh, Golda Meir. Golda Meir was the first female prime minister of Israel. You've heard of Benjamin Netanyahu. All of these ones are products of the kibbutzim. It is Israel first, Israel second, Israel last. They will defend Israel to the last drop of their blood. Now, this is how to radicalize and de-radicalize. We must have a deliberate policy of re-socialization. And we have a platform, we have a leverage for doing that, the National Orientation Agency. But I think we need to pump more things into that and see how we can salvage our children. Thirdly, of course, our schools have to recognize that the physical space of the school is only a minute aspect of the school environment today. We ourselves, I don't have answers to that. We must begin to think of how to tease out pathways of how to address that. I know that in some universities, some mission-based universities or mission-owned universities, they say children cannot use phones. They bar them. They don't allow them to use phones. They don't allow them to have you know, um, iPads and so on, except that now when you have online classes, you can stop them from using those gadgets. You know, in one ministry, one denomination that I know a long time ago, the people didn't listen to radio, they didn't watch TV. Yeah, but today, the guys even speak in American accents, you know, and, 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 and they, 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 they watch, you know, TV, you know, they, they listen to radio and all of those things. Now, which, which are contradictions, but you know we can understand them. The world is moving fast. We must move with the world. Now, coronavirus has complicated this space issue. It has extended the frontiers, the borders of the spaces beyond our control. Um, so we hope that in dealing with coronavirus, we are also dealing with one of the remedies that we require you know, to salvage the schools. Above all, and finally, if we don't get back to the place of literacy as the beginning and the end of our developmental process, the underbellies of conflict and war would remain the education sector. I thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you very much for that um, amazing lecture, sir. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. I hope we all have our questions, but um, please permit me to recognize the chief lecturers in the College of Education. I, I, um, I recognize you all. I acknowledge your, your presence here. And Mr. Oti, Eyetse Meton. I beg your pardon, please. Then Dr. Sunday Dike, uh, Mrs. Lai Koiki, proprietor of Green Spring Schools. We acknowledge you, ma'am. An association of private educators, 
we acknowledge your presence as well. Mrs. Mary O. Apo, the registrar representing the Provost St. Augustine College of Education. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your presence. So to coordinate, the, to coordinate the question and answer segment, we'll call on the chairman, Dr. Wahab Ademola Aziz, again, the provost, the CEO of, of FCE, Akoka, Federal College of Education, Federal College of Education, Technical, Akoka, to come coordinate the segment. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Ms. MC, um, all protocols duly observed. Uh, let me uh, congratulate the, the guest lecturer. Um, I was to be at his uh, center yesterday, that's uh, NI, to attend. Uh, a lecture delivered by um, Dr. Kaudi Fayemi on um, <clears throat> how to fix Nigeria. Um, the invitation was sent to me by my mentor, that was a professor, Tony Falola, um, somebody you are very close to. Um, I'm also a student of um, Professor Tudi Babali, which is also one of your colleagues. Um, listening to the guest lecturer, uh, Professor Sagai, um, gives of the hope that we still have a country because if there's something Nigeria has not lacked, Nigeria is blessed with first class intellectuals spread all over the place, both within and without. But just like he said, the political class doesn't value intellectuals. They see intellectuals as enemies because um, they derive advantages in deceiving the citizens. And then um, what the political class, the, the intellectuals do is to also educate the people. And I'm sure that um, when some of us were in the university and we are taught by the contemporaries of the professor Sergei, their generation supported active and various student unionism. We are students who go and attend symposium or symposia with professors and uh, administrators in the same place and even argue with their professors or with their teachers. I don't know whether that happens now. It's also part of the problem because uh, we must allow our youth, just like he said, to be properly educated, not just that they attended university education or they have university education or protecting education. No, they must be politically and ideologically educated so that they will be able to understand the theories that the uh, prof has also explained to us. And that um, I hope we we'll get it because uh, it's only the elites that can also service the country. Just like he advised, we must just educate our youth at all levels, at all levels. Uh, I was um, watching the, that clip by Professor Tomori 
uh, well, how to join him in, in crime for Nigeria too. Yeah, because naturally, if you watch that, you weep for Nigeria. Just, just weep. And uh, Prof, there's something before I allow to get questions from uh, the audience that um, we also need to look at. Why is it that we have this hurry of intellectuals, first-class intellectuals, that we are transmitting, you know, um, exporting to other world, other clients. But Nigeria is still bedeviled with this kind of problem. Is it because of the so-called Western democracy? Is it because our leaders refuse to be? Why is it that those years when the lacks of Amino Kano, the lacks of Awolo, the lacks of um, Sadown of Sokoto, the, the Zik, were our leaders. The resources then were not as big as we have today, but people are enjoying free education, free heads, UPN, five cardinal points, and so on and so forth. Then now we have more resources at the level of the states, but Nigerians are getting poorer. It's not issues. So, the prof's lecture is uh, self explanatory. Today is a Friday, so if I want to uh, summarize it, we won't leave this place today because, but I know that we all got um, the gist of what you told us. And um, many of you uh, have been properly educated. Um, we we'll just um, want to also take questions and comments, very short comments, so that um, we can uh, move to other items. So if you have comments and questions, please, uh, maybe on any area that is not uh, very clear or you want more clarification on some of the issues he has raised. And I'm sure that uh, later, the management of Corona will make the, the lecture, maybe um, be able to circulate the lecture, either in print or in the electronic format, so that, yes, and it can also be played on, uh, on YouTube and so on. You uh, serve as, this, as um, intellectual reference materials for most of us in the academia. So please, um, I want us to just signify and um, ask questions. Uh, please, we are in an academic environment. We are neither in the mosque or in the church. We, are, we may not be able to challenge our imam and um, pastors, but here, I think we can challenge anybody here. So please, question and um, Yes, comments or question. Then uh, those who are also who have joined virtually, I'm sure we can also take their their comments too. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we can get um, questions, comments from the dean of education, University of Lagos, um, Professor Wanga. If you have anything to say, fine. Education Secretary Barista Femi, Osho Di Solo. We can also. Um, speak up if there's any comments questions anything you just have to then the representative yabat tech um rector dr momia we can also have you speak ma'am then um representative lagos state polytechnic as well then the registrar saint augustine we can have you all just say something while we before we go into the main questions proper thank you ma'am all right sir Thank you very much. All protocols do really observed. Just want to make a comment that in preparing for safe fast schools of the future, I think it has to start from here. As educators, we need to think of the The current teachers we have have not been prepared 
for the situation we have found ourselves in, what is now generally referred to as the new normal. So as a teacher training institution, we must ensure and endeavor to prepare our teachers such that they will be able to handle the current challenge and even the ones that are yet to come. And one of the ways of going about it as much as possible is to ensure that the new technologies, the new ways of doing things are inculcated in our teacher trainees so that by the time they go into the field, some of these problems that will emerge, they would have been prepared to handle them. One of the reasons why students don't like school today is that our methodologies are outdated. We are not deploying the new technologies. And so it is important that as a teacher training institution, in the preparation of our teachers of the future, we must take care of this new technology so that learning becomes attractive, learning becomes play. And what, once that happens, then we can be sure that some of these vices that we're talking about today would have become a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Please, as we stand up, as we um, rise to give the your comments or everything, let's kindly know who you are. Just try to um, introduce yourself so everybody could know. Ma'am? Okay, please, can you? I'm Dr. Taiwo Momia, and I'm from Yaba College of Technology. I want to say that just as Prof said, we have to make sure by all means we keep our children in school. Now, I, I see that there is, there is a new ideology rising amongst the young ones. They are gradually feeling that schooling is not necessary that you can actually make it in life without necessarily going to school. And you find a lot of them trying to jump out of school, feeling you don't really have to be in the four walls of school to make it in life. And apart from that, they also realize that there are a number of people who have been to school, the four walls of school, but uh, somehow it's like it is not working for them. And so why do they really have to be in school? I think we really have to do a lot in revamping the school system, getting to keep these children in school so that we will have good outcomes and then we'll be able to solve the security issues. Thank you very much. Any other comments or question, please? Good afternoon, everybody. Resting on the existing protocol. My name is uh, Barrister Femi Agibadi Ugusi. My own, uh, because uh, taking from the topic here, I think uh, the topic is larger than the one that is uh, within the confines of our school uh, school premises. The major problem we have is the canker worm in our society. They, we often, we learned in the past that the school is the mirror of the society. The level of corruption in our system is enormous. The corruption extends to the building of mines on tribalism, on uh, ethnicism, uh, ethnicism, and the uh, other vices that are into our minds. Even at the top, the various problems we had this year. Fulani, people, this and this and that. And there at the top, most of 
statement was, 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 was came out from the presidency concerning the problems we have. They sent a lot of shivers to our spines. And uh, when we have our children, they watch the television, they see things going on here and there, politicians, uh, building houses, buying private jets and everything. Then the average student in the school, especially those, of, those, those politicians who are not even graduates of any university, who are dropouts, they flaunt their wealth here and there, and the children look back and say, see my parents stealing the ground every time and has no bicycle. I want to make it myself. What do they do? That is why you have uh, 419, you have Yahoo, you have everything because they want to make money. And so they, we have removed education from their minds. You have removed everything from their souls. So what they now depend on what did not think of is money, money, money. And that is the problem we have in Nigeria. We have different backgrounds. Our religious backgrounds, our cultural backgrounds, everything. And there is, it seems there is a kind of confusion. We don't even know where we are going. And the children themselves are confused. Like my own son, who just graduated as a pharmacist. Are you doing that here? Bofe, would you like to get something to do with your pharmacy? He said that, leave me, leave me. What can pharmacy fetch me? What can it fetch me? It's not now, you don't need the money now. You build your future on this profession. You can take your graphic as your passion. He said, no, just let me see, let me sort myself out. Because this is the problem we have. There is serious conflicts. Conflicts in their minds. Even we parents, we have the conflicts, except we want to be ourselves. An average teacher, an average teacher, how much do, 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 do we earn as teachers, as educators? What is some? And uh, a nonary boy, who is even a student somewhere is riding big, big cars. And the teacher, the educated teacher for that matter, has nothing to show for years of uh, uh, a service in teaching profession. So I don't know. And again, we are all confused though, because no matter where you say our technical, our uh, professors, our uh, this is a, let me tell you. Everybody is now, uh, is now, is now, uh, it, 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 I want to call it a contagious disease because, yes, an average professor, yeah, and that is the truth. A professor who becomes the doctor of the state, the biggest chunk of the resources of the states. What, what are we talking about? So we have the only we have to retrace our steps, whether technology or no technology. It is this this the, uh, policies, the policies government make. They make a policy today, tomorrow, the policies. What do we do? We only need to you know reorganize ourselves. When we talk of these uh, agitations, Biafra or no Biafra is legitimate as far as I'm concerned. Because when you know you have a marriage with certain people and they are, you are trying to bring something up and you are trying to drag them down, they will say, no, please, I don't want to be dragged down. So the professor, our guest uh, speaker, concluded by saying the only solution to our problem is literacy. Yes, literacy. I think I will lower advocated this long, long time ago. And that is, that had been the policy of Babu Lawa. But will those people, because they don't share the same culture, they don't share the same vision, 
Would they allow him to survive, to even implement it? That is the problem we have. Ethnicism, uh, ethnicity, uh, tribalism, and everything. Everything is there. Thank you very much, sir. So, thank you very much. So, can we have other comments or questions? Okay. So let's uh, let's hear from him then before we go to the back seat. Thank Please you. Let's be as brief as possible as we can. Yes, as I can. stand on let's the existing go. protocol. My my take is a is a question to the to our guest. Uh, sorry, my name is uh, Felix Akinabi, representing the uh, provost of Topmost College of Education. Um, it's a question. Uh, our our guest lecture talked about um, social mobility. And also mentioned that when we are when we are in the time past that uh, parents spent fortunes to train their children, and uh, those days education you know was seen as um, do or die because without it you cannot go far. Now, sir, how do we get back to that social order that have become um, so it, it's of the past to bring things you know together so we can experience those things that we need to enjoy. Uh, those days, both in the education sector and in the society, especially in, in, in this sector of education, where how do we go back to the social order which we had before? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please, um, the madam at the back. Thank you. All protocols duly observed. I'm still standing on the existing protocol. My name is Mary Ipo. I'm representing the provost at Augustine's College of Education, Akoka. I just want to add to what they had already said. I feel that the family has a lot to do because these days, if we all notice, even we as parents, we don't really have the time to play our role as parents to our children. Education starts from the home, from the family. And if we fail to, if we miss that initial stage in inculcating the education on our children, then they go out. That which we fail to give them at home, they will not get it out there. And they even get that which they are not supposed to get outside. And they take that seriously, even more than, because we have failed on our part to give them what we are supposed to give them. I remember in those days, apart from what the parents would teach us, we still learn even in the school, primary school then, secondary school, we're taught moral education, we're taught CRS. But these days, I don't think those things are in existence any longer. So we need to really retrace our steps and go back to those things. It will help us a great deal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The next. I'm starting on the existing protocol. Uh, Mr. S.A. will I be representing uh, TGPS, the uh, General Permanent Secretary of Education, DC6. Um, I my question to this one is this: um, Looking at what uh, Prof. just said, I also well, thank God for the life of our professor. But there's one thing: the society, so to say, they know the sponsors, they know the power behind all these things. But not, not, I mean, the society is not taking any, 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 uh, any step to, to, to tackle it. I mean, like last week, at Enugu last week, the JCC this year, STEAM, is on these uh, security issues all over Nigeria. And we were there last week. And it means Nigeria is now waking up to that aspect. But the issue is this. Initiation of courses of all our students is outside the school. Membership, uh, the whatever is from outside the school. And at the same time, we all know that this world today is the world of influence. Everybody wants to belong, world of power. And that's how they, 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 they are introduced to these things. But how do we now call the source, go to the origin of this thing and stop it so that this education we now have uh, the peace will be really there and the progress will be there as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. The next person. Any other 
Okay, I think uh, we can. Okay, we have um, someone from the activity. After that, we allow the good afternoon to, everyone to respond. Yeah. I'm Augustine Modi, the Dean School of Education, Corona College of Education. I want to say a very big thank you to Prof because he gave us the facts, the puzzles, and also gave us the remedies. And in one of his uh, words, he told us that there is need for us to renovate the state. I think if the state is fully held accountable for whatever we do, this issue of insecurity will drastically come down. I'm of the opinion saying that we as stakeholders, parents, teachers, and as well, members of the society, we should give less. When I say less, I mean less accolades to people whose uh, wealth or whatever they have are not genuinely uh, to us. Let's stop recognizing these people. And when you stop recognizing the people that has all this to influence people in the society, people will not be willing to join. That is my own stick. Thank you. Thank you. I Dr. We... Dr. Lawa, we like to ask questions. Online? From online, yes. Okay. So, Dr. Lawa is a member of the Governing Council. Can you please put on your video? Okay. Okay, we we have some questions there. Dr. Abayomi Sarumi, we like to ask the professor. He said, if we as people of Africa have identified the administrative construct called African countries as a fundamental problem, why have we not at ECOWAS or EU level not sat down to rearrange ourselves? And the second one from him, he said, where where is the role of the home, the family in the uncontrolled species you mentioned? Another question from, okay, this person did not write his name. How can we start the radicalization in Nigeria? That is changing the orientation of the generation in school, of this current generation in school. Um, Professor, sir, kindly share your thoughts and solution to the very recent incident at Doen College. Bullying is a non-security problem in our school. It's a non-security problem in our school. Okay. We we'll still have more. Okay. Uh, Sheyi from online said, apart from sensitizing or education, educating the younger and the older generation. Are there other proactive steps? The education, education stakeholders, administrators, teachers, lecturers, etc., can take within their controllable space in the fight against insurgency. Why is there a sudden increase in insecurity in schools in Nigeria? How can these problems be solved? And pupils educated about these problems in the educational sectors in Nigeria. What, are, what role should the school heads and management play to eradicate or solve these problems in schools, especially problems of bullying in schools? Another one from online joins online. The insecurity started with a group of people, politicians, ensuring they make another group, the educationists, irrelevant. They took out few 
and win them to their side. How do we correct this abnormality? And lastly, Emmanuel uh, Ndubusi from online, how can we cope with the Child Protect Protection Act currently in operation in our country? It doesn't favor teachers and parents to play their roles effectively in, in children upbringing. I have more questions coming. Professor, sir, you spoke about the root of our security issues, reaching as deep as the origin of the, nation, of the national identity, which you called false. My questions, what roadmap can you share with the private players in the education sector on this disapproving the falsehood and returning to our originality as a nation? And secondly, are these pri private players actually enabled and empowered to make significant impact in national orientation? Can the Israeli mo model work for Nigeria? Why have African leaders shying away from addressing the mistakes of the uh, B uh, Berlin Conference? which I see as a foundation and genesis of many problems being faced in Africa. This one from Dr. Olautonkuku. Dear professor, if you are in, in charge, that is in control of things in the nation, give major steps that you will take that could change the fortunes of Nigeria in the face of current challenges in Nigeria educational system. Thank you. Okay. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Um, you, you, of course, know that it would be almost impossible to respond to all of the questions, but let me acknowledge my dean. Um, I didn't know you were, you know, the uh, person of reference. I'm very grateful to you. You know why, and I'll remain grateful to you. Uh, thank you for our paths that have crossed and how you have become my uh, padiman. That's that's very good. Thank you, thank you, Dean. Um, you know, bullying, bullying. Um, first, before I come to you, you know, there's a way we all, you know, uh, reminiscence on the past and get very nostalgic in our belief that the past is always better than the present. I mean, and I use my daughter um, as a point of reference. Uh, each time she visited home at the University of Ibadan campus, she would say, ah, daddy, things have changed. You know, when we were, and I, I look at her and I say, look at this kid, <laughs> where we were, where, where, how, how many years ago here? But, you know, she has joined the class of, you know, the, the older people um, who, who now pontificate on, you know, um, the, the, the present situation. They know how to, and they say, these things are no longer happening. Let me tell you, all the things that you did when you were young, younger people are doing them and even more, but you cannot get to their spaces. They, in another five years, would be like you, saying, ah, what has happened in our days, you see? So that, in our days, is a continuous thing that never comes to an end. Um, so when I see people who say, how can we return? Return to what? It's, it's almost impossible to return to anything. That is the truth. The, the, the only things we can hope, you know, would linger on, or we can retrace our steps on, or we can you know, strengthen, would be the kinds of values that you have all identified here. For instance, when you say um, money, everything is about money today. Um, now that past also had money, you know? Uh, maybe not in the same way. But remember that that past didn't have the population we have today. 
Remember that that past didn't have the kinds of youths that we had today. Um, today, people who are 55 and older are becoming endangered because the younger people are taking over. And they are in such a hurry um, that many of the things that you cherish, they no longer do. I'm talking about value transformation. I think that our schools, um, including our universities and tertiary institutions, also get it wrong when we think that all we need would be moral values and moral leadership. There's a lot more you know, to the things that we need you know, than just saying you must go to church, you must go to the mosque, you must profess to be a Christian or a good Muslim. There are things in life you know, that challenge you um, that you must be prepared for, but which we don't have the capacities to respond to. And we have identified many of them today, but our value system would have to change. Um, you know, I'm sure in this, in, this, in this hall, I don't know how many people would remember that, you know, you, you, you didn't buy your first car as a Mercedes Benz, <laughs> you know? I mean, they, they, there seemed to be some progression um, from first buying a Beetle. Um, to, I, I remember, you know, when I bought a Mercedes in the University of Ibadan, an older professor came to me and said to me, you don't have parents? I say, ah. He says, you are not afraid. You went to buy messages. I mean, I, I, I mean, I felt so bad even to go home, you know, to explain to my wife that we're in trouble. Though. I mean, come to think of it. But you know, today, um, many things would happen. I remember going to my father and giving him. He says, "How much is this?" I say, ten thousand. I says, "What do I need it for?" This is too much money. Take, just take, you know, you give me 500 now, that's enough. I mean, I'm sure that today a parent will say, how much is this? Ten, is that all you can give to me? I mean, your mates give 100,000. So, so the world is changing. You know, we must, we must, take, must take cognizance of all of these things and, and know that every person, I like what somebody said, every person is in trouble though. This is the truth. We're all in trouble. What we're trying to find ways out of, you know, would be all of these troubles. They are very complex. Um, bullying. Bullying has been there from time. I, I went to um, boarding house in secondary school, uh, you know, and in university, but take the secondary school. I, I was in class one in 1970. I was bullied through and through in 1970. Um, but the height was in 1973, um, when class four, and these guys who were in class five, you know, had double deck beds. Mm -hmm. And they had a peculiar form of punishment. They would put the, the double decks close to each other and tell you to suspend yourself. And underneath, they are whipping those things just in case you drop and you must drop. I mean, that beating got so serious that I remember running home you know, and telling my parents I would never go to school again, you know, and so on. So bullying has been there. What perhaps you know, is a little newer today is that there are new forms of bullying, uh, you know, enhanced and facilitated by new technologies of bullying. One of them is cultism. Um, you know, somebody is saying, look at the last you know, incident, what, what do we say? That's terrible. Uh, but it is simply you know, um, a manifestation of what is going on in many schools. Um, and one of the contributors to a debate that I had said, what many parents are looking for is how to say they have sent their children to the most expensive schools, as if it is, you know, the more expensive a school is, the better it is. It's not, it's not true. Um, so again, as parents, we have a great role to play. Um, I, I, I'm sorry for many children. I know this because, you know, I was vice chancellor. I, and, and each time, you know, they brought, and let me tell you, you know, some of the things that I find really baffling, just to extend the frontiers of the puzzles you talked about. There were children, you know, in the university that didn't pay fees, and we said to them, you couldn't write exams. And their mothers came. I'm sorry, you know, this is not a gender bias. Their mothers came and said, sir, please don't let the father know. 
that they used the money, school fees money for business. And you know, they, so if you just give us two weeks, you know, we'll get the money. And so. I mean, think of a mother, think of a child. I mean, come on now, you see, you see, is that child going to be different? Never. There were children in school who had cars that their parents didn't know. They didn't know about, they, you know I mean? And one or two died. And then they say, oh, they had the accident and they died. Say, Who, whose car were they driving? Say, their car. Say, what? How? So parents, many of us just throw money at children. Yeah, that's what we do, you know. And, and the, the, the fathers say, their mothers, you know, it's their responsibility. Just go and, you know. Um, so we, we are not part of it. There's a point that Hillary Clinton was making. If we disaggregate the family so fundamentally, you know, we'll never be able to get proper families, you know. So familyhood is key, it's very crucial, it's critical. And I, I think that, you know, school authorities must also be more sensitive, you know, to these deviant, you know, tendencies and dispositions that our children have that manifest in, you know, things like, you know, bullying and cultism. Um, you, you, you can't be careful enough, but I'm sure as we did in our days, there are ways you can, you know, um, have surveillance systems, you can have intelligence systems, you know, and, and those things would help, you know, even in the dormitories and so on, those things help. Now, um, you know, somebody says, we know the things in town, even these uh, terrorists, and so, we know them. Why are we not, why are we not doing anything about them? Uh, you know, I will challenge all of us. We all live in neighborhoods. In those neighborhoods where we live, we have some criminals and we know them. Now, see how we turn things on their heads in our country. If I go to the police and say, you know, that guy is an armed robber. You know, even members of the community in the neighborhood will be the first to come to chastise me. What's your problem? The, the man knows to, to know. And, you know, the police, of course, will get by and say, that is that man that came to tell us, you know, that's, that's, you know. So all of us are guilty. Uh, not because, you know, we don't know what is wrong, but we just are afraid, you know, to go to town. You know, when we say these things cannot happen in America, these things cannot happen, in, you know, in Europe, do you know why they cannot happen? Is this point I made about having common spaces, common interests, common grounds, common problems, and having shared views of our togetherness. Look, if an old woman or a young man or a young woman sees something amiss in the United States of America, especially, that person is likely to call 911 and say, I just noticed something. I don't know how you deal with it. So the intelligence network is based on citizen ownership. The police, the military, they cannot perform magic. Your you know, expertise, your effectiveness is as good as the information that you get. If, if we volunteer, as good citizens, you know, volunteer this sense. We are part of our own security architecture. It begins with us. And, and, and you know, that's what I used to tell the students in my university. You are your own security. So don't say, oh, there are no lights and no, 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 no. Security begins with you. How can you go out without locking your door, for instance? You, you should lock your door. I mean, if you call me, say, oh, you know, I, I went out and they, they, if they broke into your room, that's a different matter. But if we find out that, you know, your door was, this is even in your house, you know, when you're going to sleep, you should ensure that your door is locked. I mean, I think these are basic responsibilities that we owe ourselves. Um, Chairman, you were saying we have all of these resources. We have, you know, the showing cars of this world. We have the... Uh, Smokers, we have everyone, you know, fantastic people, DKs, a lot of wonderful people. The dean of education from 
And, and yet, what are we doing? As he said that, you know, I was reminded of the experience that I personally had in South Africa um, as a head of department of political science. Every month, and, and uh, listen to this, every month we had a meeting with President Nelson Mandela. All heads of departments of political science in all universities in South Africa. And it was always to ask, how are we doing? Are there steps we are taking that are not good? You know, and so on. It was not only political scientists, they were meeting this way. They were meeting heads of departments of economics, heads of departments of you know, uh, dentistry, you know, all of these things, and asking questions. Now, you see, people who um, are serious about the things they do are involved in what you call strategic planning. Okay, things just don't happen. We, 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 we are like a rudderless people. To be rudderless is to <laughs> just move anyhow. You don't, you don't have any sense of direction. But when, when you have strategic plans, you know, I mean, I'm sure that people who know about strategic planning will tell me, oh yes, we know it's SWAT, SWAT. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, strengths, isn't it? Even such a basic template, you know, would help you. You know, um, let me tell you, in 1987 was when South Africa decided apartheid must crumble. And they decided apartheid was going to be dissolved on their own terms. Not because of liberation struggle. That's when Prime Minister Pick Butter gave an address in Congress titled, We Have Crossed the Rubicon. We adapt or we die. So that day he got to Parliament and said to them, we have crossed the Rubicon. We adapt or we die, but we are going to adapt. And they adapted. How did they adapt? They brought together the finest brains in South Africa and invited experts from outside the country and said to them, sit down here. We'll pay you so much, but tell us how we are going to proceed. Number one, we want to hand over power, but we don't want to lose power. Did you see? <laughs> and they had that strategic plan. So all of the things happening in South Africa now were foretold. They knew them. Should I shock you? They say, what's the greatest threat to South Africa? Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, Nigeria. So from day one, they had to demonize Nigeria. And, and they saw Nigeria as, you know, this threat that must be conquered. This is the science. You know, today we're talking about Omicron and people are getting emotional. It's the science that determines what we are doing because Omicron might yet change today. We are not scientists. We are just sitting here. If they find something else, that's a new direction. You know, but those who are scientifically minded also have strategic plans that are hinged on science. And as much as possible, they want to try to see how much of all of these unforeseen and unknowns can be domesticated and subjected to control. Is that right? That's, that's the essence of science. Science is to explain and predict. So once you're able to explain something, you're also predicting at the same time. So the point is, we are not strategically minded people. We live one day at a time. I mean, if, if we, we, we flow with the tide, we, we don't look at the tide from the opposite side, you know, to say, how can we, can we change the course? Can we? No, no, we don't do such things. Um, and our intellectuals are not helping matters also. Let truth be told. If, if our universities can be closed for nine months, uh, one year, and nobody is listening to us, they are simply telling us, you know what? You are not relevant. We can do without you. And once a society says to a university, we can do without you, it tells you where that society is headed. You know, but, but this, is, this is the tragedy of, 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 of our life and our living as, as a people. Um, 
the 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 um, um, somebody talked about politicians, but you know, really, those politicians. I think that will be subject to another day. But but the truth is that there's a politician in all of us. We are all politicians, all of us. You know, that to the extent that we agree or disagree, we are we are we are playing that part of us that is political. The final one I want to take is you know somebody says um, why has ECOWAS and AU you know not um, addressed you know this and now. You know, in, in 1963, when the uh, OAU was founded, the leaders who met said, if we open up, if we open up and say, can we begin to create organic states in places of states that came through the Berlin conference, then Africa were opening up to endless conflicts. At that time, we had the all ever movement, all ever movement, you know, that the Evers, uh, on the borderline between Togo and Ghana. Um, you know, so they had the all ever movement. They wanted to form one country, an ever country. You had the all Somalia movement. Somalis are scattered, you know, they are in Kenya, they are in Sudan, they are in uh, Uganda, they are in Somalia. They are, so they're everywhere. And then, so they say they want to be one. So in their wisdom, the African heads of state sat down and said, you know what? we are going to adopt the principle of um, allowing the boundaries remain. The, the, the boundaries are inviolable. So we'll take them as they are, as a given. And again, whether it has helped or not, and I think it has helped, it has put pressure on saying, look, go and see how you can work together. The question of you know, break up and you know, fragmentation, that's the easy way out, but we are not going to do it. Um, so let me repeat again. What is happening is that all of us are struggling to see how we can accommodate ourselves you know, within existing systems. And somebody says, why are all of these things happening now? They're happening now because democratization has opened spaces that were closed before. And you know, when democratization happens, it simply reinforces what we call the J-curve theory. You know the letter J. The letter J starts from that and it gets to the bottom and begins to look up. According to this theory of conflict and how you know um, frustration um, can lead to aggression and revolt, when things get very bad, they are dipping. You see, that's, that, that's just, that just long, the long eye. The, the, the things are deteriorating. You know, what you used to buy for 10 Naira is now 200 Naira. What you used to buy for 1,000 is now 50,000. You are going down. And then you get to the bottom of the world. That's hell. That's the, the lower you of the J. You see? Now, if human beings were rational, you would expect that when they are at the lowest of that you, that's when they will revolt and rebel and say, never, this is, this is too much, we can't do it. But according to this theory, they don't do that. It's when things are beginning to get better, when the, the, the eye, the opposite eye is beginning to look up. It's at that intersection of the little eye on top of the day, that they revolt. Why? Because now they are saying, when we we're dipping down, even when we we're in the bottom most part, there was no hope. So you say, so it's possible. That's why they revolt when the eye is beginning to look up. Because now they are saying, we cannot wait anymore. Because now they see the possibility that they never saw before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I think um, we we have come to the end of the, the lecture and the interaction, interactive session. Um, I think somebody also has a question, Prof. Uh, so I want you to address it. Whether 
because many people think that uh, as a country that uh, Nigeria has um, that Nigeria is a worthy country because I mean of the oil and uh, those Nigerians have the resources to fight this insurgency and uh, Boko Haram. In the real sense, do we have the resources to do that? Well, one way to answer that question is to say, if Nigeria were, say, Benin Republic or Togo or Ghana or Liberia, so on, would have ceased to exist a long time ago. The point about us having resources, um, it's, it's the meat you know, of Nigeria's greatness is a meat. Um, the, the bulk of our wealth is to be found in the informal sector. 70 to 80% of the productive, you know, um, um, categories in our country belongs to the informal sector. And that is not accounted for. But let's even look at the face of the formal sector. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the budget of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the federal government, the state governments, the local governments, all of those budgets put together, all of them would be less than the budget of New York City Council in one year. Did you hear me? the research budget of Harvard University in the United States of America is bigger than the budget of the federal government of Nigeria, the state, 36 state governments, and the 774 local governments of Nigeria combined. Research budget of just one, it's a private university, Harvard. So much for our wealth. And you know, so when we say, you know, that Nigeria is very rich. It's a myth. Um, because if our citizens don't have anything to show for it, we're a very poor country. That's the truth. I mean, go to the Lagos Ibano Expressway and see how people are suffering. Go on our streets. It's just, you know, by the grace of God that people are not dropping dead every minute. Life is difficult. Poverty is real. How can such a rich country wallow in so much poverty? Puzzle and contradiction. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we are all better educated and that um, um, in addition to what Prof. I just told us that uh, Nigeria is a poor country, uh, because um, um, one, one other area that we have not squarely addressed is the issue of um, the education sector. There's this argument or belief that if you don't send your children abroad, even to the public of Benin, you can't get better education. I know that Nigeria has one of the best institutions in terms of personnel, in terms of intellectuals, in terms of lecturers, maybe facilities to a certain extent. And, but whether the state has also seeing that as an opportunity. For example, a country that has um, medical schools, professor of medicine, then the ratio of medical doctors to citizens is very, very low. That same country will also peg the number of medical students that should be. Admitted. Unilag, maybe we'll be giving 100. 
medical students. Still, we don't have enough medical doctors. To read medicine, you must score as high as 90%. So in the other, other areas too. So one will be wondering whether we, we understand. And these same lecturers, once they cross the border, they just need little environments and they fit in in America. In so, and we keep on doing the same thing. Those doctors that produced even with the the resources, the mega resources of the state will be left uncatered for, and they cross the border and go to another country, Canada. You don't even need to apply for visa again. Still, these are products of Nigerian institutions. So, and that's until we believe, we also believe in the system that Nigerians did that come. We can turn our institutions, both public and private, to also hand a lot of um, is it foreign whatever, so that we don't have to go to Harvard, we don't have to go to this thing to get the best education. We have them, so maybe it's also part of the the education that um, we need to also give to our students so that they will understand uh, the extent of the challenges and problems we are having. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we are better enriched, and uh, I'm sure that by the time we get back to our different locations, um, we also encourage um, our institutions that are here that we want to be attending more of these um, uh, public um, uh, lectures. I uh, remember that in, uh, as a dean in uh, 20, is it 2010 or so, um, when I organize a, a public lecture in my college. I say, ah, what's this guy up to? <laughs> you know, but he enriches the system, you know, so that is people can also listen to, I mean, idea that uh, our intellectuals have. So we appreciate the, the decision of the management, the board and council of the Corona College uh, for organizing this uh, a public lecture, and that um, the, the college has made a right choice. Uh, one of the finest brains, of course, he attended the, the Premier University. So uh, I'm also a product of Premier University. <laughs> so uh, we thank you very much. And I'm sure that, um, I'm sure in the next few distance, you will be seeing a lot of letters from our sister institutions. So um, I say a good product doesn't rest. So you can rest. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we also appreciate, I know the, I'm not giving a vote of thanks, but as the chairman, I'm also using my power as the chairman so that you don't think that uh, this chairman is not powerful. Um, <laughs> so we appreciate the members of audience for also enriching the discourse. I think it's a, it's an exchange and it's also an interaction. We thank you and uh, those that also that have also joined virtually too. We appreciate and uh, we, be, we hope that uh, um, in the next few days, this lecture, I mean the content, will be in circulation uh, to also um, continue the discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sirs. We appreciate. Thank you so much, Sirs. Please permit me to call on our chairman, um, CSED Governing Council, person of Mr. Adid Dotson Sulaiman, for his um, contribution on this um, on this program. Please, can you kindly his virtual? Okay, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, special thanks to our guest uh, lecturer. Um, we just listened to a most enlightening uh, lecture. And um, of course, congratulations to the management of the college for, for initiating this uh, 
lecture series. This is the third in the series. And it looks like it gets better and better and better with each, with each uh, edition. And for those who have participated, I think you just stay tuned. I'm sure there is more in the pipeline. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Osagai, and um, for a most uh, illuminating lecture. Of course, reading your profile or listening to your profile being read and so on, I would say you haven't disappointed. You haven't disappointed at all. And I hope in the future, we'll, if we call you to come and uh, talk to us again, I'm sure you are obliged. So on behalf of the council, I would say thank you very much for, 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 your, for your time uh, this afternoon, this morning, this afternoon. And my thanks to all those who have uh, put this together. So we expect uh, there will be a fourth one and a fifth one. So I hope the, the manager of the, of, the, of the college will be announcing the details of the subsequent uh, events. For me, it's been a pleasure. And uh, 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 good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for, for listening in. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for that. Um, just a quick um acknowledgement to um Dr. Alex Agbagbara, Dr. Amol Kende, Dr. Maru for Lade Joel. Thank you for joining on site online. Thank you, Dr. Um, Tunde Lawal, Mrs. Margaret Ibinoba, then Professor Emmanuel Adedon of Mountain Top University. Thank you so much for joining us. So right about now, we'll call on um, um, Mrs. Nora Jagade for the vote of thanks. Mrs. Nora Jagade, the Training and Development Manager, Corona College of Education Consult. Please, a round of applause, please. Thank you very much, moderator. Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the local organizing committee, I wish to say a very big thank you for participating in the third public lecture of the Corona College of Education. You will agree with me that the lecture has been very, very engaging, thought provoking and enriching. Our minds have been invaded by lots of information, interpretations and visions a very big thank you to Professor Egosa Emmanuel Osage. Please, can we give him a round of applause? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for giving us a lot to reflect on concerning the, the issues, the issues on our country and the emergent security issues. It's, it's really worth thinking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Today's lecture has brought to light our individual and collective responsibility towards building a strong space. And we promise that we will work towards it. Every one of us, we will ensure that we do something about it. We'd like to recognize the, our special guests. We want to acknowledge the presence of our chairman, of the Corona College of Education and member of the Governing Board Council, Corona Schools Trust Council, Dr. Dotson Suleiman, MFRO. Thank you very much, sir, for joining in. You were very attentive all through, and we appreciate your presence. Would like to recognize the presence of Professor Ubaga, faculty of the University of Lagos, the Dean. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. We are glad you came. And Mrs. Uwebu, Provost St. Augustine College of Education. Thank you very much, ma'am. We're glad you came. Oh, Mrs. Mr. Wolabi SA, the Tutor General Education District says, our Papa Ushudi Express. We're welcome. We're glad you came, sir. The Ms. Barista Femi Ajibade Ogunusi. Thank you, sir, for coming. We are glad. We are glad you are part of this program. Dr. Taiwo Omomia, representing the Rector Yaba College of Education, Yaba Tech. Is Yaba, Yaba Tech, Yaba. Thank you very much, ma'am. And the Rector, Lagos Polytechnic, Mrs. Aderunke Ige. We are glad you came. Thank you, ma'am. Representing the Provost, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Ugo Amadi, the topmost college of education. We are glad you came. Also present with us online, would like to recognize Dr. Joe Mikiliwa. I suspect that he is the husband of our provost. Thank you very much, sir. We are glad you participated in this program. And um, Dr. Jumoke Olani Pekun, thank you very much, Dr. Sir, ma'am, Jumoke, ma'am, for coming. Dr. Olautan Kuku, thank you, sir. Dr. Tunde Lawal, thank you, sir. Dr. Deyemi Bami Dele, thank you, sir. And Dr. Martin Obinho, our immediate past provost, sir. We are glad you participated. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Alice Egba. Egbagbara, I hope I'm correct. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Dr. Amaokende, thank you, sir. Dr. Maruf Oladejo, we are glad you participated. And Dr. Tunde Lawal, thank you, sir, for participating. Mrs. Margaret Igbinoba, we are glad you joined us. Professor Emmanuel Adedu, thank you, Professor of the Mountain Top University. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mrs. Lai Koiki, the proprietor of Green Spring Schools. Thank you, ma'am. We are glad you participated. Association of Private Educators in Nigeria. Thank you very much for joining in. And um, Intergeneral Education District 2, St. Agnes Catholic Church, Road, Maryland. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't I can't get I can't read Otto Otto I hope I am Otto two Otto two thank you. Oh okay, but it's not written yet. Two them is not written yet. Thank you very much. We appreciate your participation and the education district too, Mrs. Sajola. Thank you very much, ma'am. We are glad you joined us and Mrs. Mary O I Paul the registrar representing the Provost St. Augustine College of Education. Thank you, ma'am. We are so glad. Paraventure, we have missed out your name. We apologize. We recognize your presence and we are glad you participated. It's been very, very enriching, very insightful. Once again, thank you to our professor and to our chairman, sir. I was trying to get your apologies. I wanted to call you by your name and um, I guess I have to peep. Dr. Wahab Ademola Aziz. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate your contribution. We are so glad you joined us. And to everyone, if I didn't mention your name, it is not because you are not important. You are VIP and we are glad you joined us. Thank you once again. So on behalf of the local organizing committee, I say a big thank you to everyone. Thank you to our management, Corona Schools, Corona College of Education to the management staff. I say thank you for this beautiful opportunity. I'm glad. Have a great day. And we look forward to having you during our public lecture series four. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nora Jagede for that. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the third public lecture for this year, and we hope to see you in the fourth series. We will all rise for the national anthem. Before then, please, um, we call on Mr. Teller Okbeolu, the Dean of Students Affairs for the prayer, closing prayer, please. Let's close our eyes. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom you've given us. We commit the educational sector and the nation at large onto your hand that you help us to solve this um, emerging problem. We pray for every participant on site and online as we go back to our respective places you'll be with us. Guide us, O Lord. By the time we meet for the fourth public lecture series, we pray that will come with joy, with more testimony of what you are doing in our system. The educational system will pray to be number one globally. Make Nigeria great again, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
<laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. All right. Thank you very much. Sir. The speech with the guest speaker, please. Let's all come for um, a shot with the guest speaker, please. Thank you. <laughs>